when I was a kid, I would really look forward to the summer holiday because every day I would wake up and I would say the following, Mum, 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 please take me to the zoo, Mum. And thankfully, she did. It was a joy for me to do this, come into contact with animals. On the most important day of my young life, I stood there as the giraffe was reaching down and I begged my mum to lift me up so that I could feed it something and the giraffe stretched just a little bit further than it had been previously. Its giant head came down and it wrapped its long lilac tongue right around my face. I felt the giraffe. It was a really formative moment. It was a tremendous moment. And I think at that point I was infected with a deep love of animals. And that love of animals can only come through contact, actually meeting them, seeing them, feeling them and smelling them. And you can only do that in zoos. So my hope is that on a couple of days a year, someone might come through that gate, bringing a small child with them. And that child might stand in front of one of these enclosures. And inside it, a spark might be ignited. A passion, a lifelong passion for animals and for wildlife. And with that passion will come an urge to conserve that life. Then the zoo would have done its job. Now what you're about to see is a behind the scenes look at this lovely zoo, at Charlotte's Zoo. Isle of Wight Zoo, the zoo on the beach. I'm Charlotte Corney and I'm the zoo's director. We're going to take you on a really interesting tour behind the scenes, showing you some of the things that you don't get to see as a normal day visitor. So why don't we start with when Charlie Brown the lion took a recent trip to see the dentist. Any veterinary procedure carries a risk, but here the risk is greater because Charlie Brown is quite an elderly lion. So today is a difficult day for the team. We've changed the plan slightly and as Charlie's lying down and seems really relaxed we're going to try just to sort of dart him very softly from here. Our resident vet Matt Twitchett has had an association with the zoo since childhood when he worked as a volunteer. Administering the cocktail of tranquilizing drugs is a particularly stressful time for Matt and then we all have to wait patiently. Oh, he's, he's going. Nala has been Charlie Brown's companion for many years and is concerned for him, so she needs reassuring whilst the procedure takes place. With high-risk animals, it is imperative that the move to our vet centre happens without delay, so we can anaesthetise before the sedative wears off. The specialist dental team are already in situ, waiting to receive Charlie Brown. He has had some past history of dental issues. He's had a tooth extraction in the past, and also his brother last year sadly was diagnosed with oral cancer, so it's preventative really, and that's the reason for it knocking him out today. It's a good luck plat. Mm. The veterinary dentist <coughs> is um, there to take over as soon as the animal's anaesthetised fully. She can start examining the teeth um, and seeing exactly what needs to be done because obviously all we can do is visually check uh, 
and we could see that Charlie's teeth are not in a very good shape but until we get him in um, into the vet room we can't we can't know any more than that so she will have a good visual examination then start x-raying the teeth and seeing what's going on down in the roots and then formulate a plan as to what she's going to do what corrective work she's going to do the decision was with Charlie Brown that he would have a couple of teeth extracted um, where he'd had some breakage in his teeth and he had some infection and abscess forming so she had to extract the teeth, it's just really hard work, you know, these animals have very, very deep roots. So you need to summon all the will that you have and all the physical force to get those teeth out. Luckily it was not the canine teeth that she had to extract. We have had that in the past and Charlie's actually had a lower canine taken out and that took about four hours. So you can imagine that's a lot of sweat um, and a lot, of, a lot of willpower needed. But in this instance, he just needed some um, molar teeth taking out and he also had a root canal as well. So he had a root filling. Um, and then he had painkillers and antibiotics and, and so forth. But he was asleep throughout it all, so it's really nice. And um, I wish that when I went to the dentist, I'd have such a, an easygoing experience, to be honest, because when Charlie Brown woke up, he was none the wiser, really. I mean, a little bit sore, but um, to be honest, their pain threshold is really high. But that's got disease on the end of the root as well, so that's painful for him as well. Yeah, that's amazing. Right. Emotionally, when you're dealing with an animal that you have a really close personal bond with, it, it's going to be more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I just thinking I might lose my t-shirt. Okay, great. Right, are we ready to, right, ready to move? Right, down this way. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Jeez, right. Who had the good light? Uh, you want it? Okay, uh, can we let me blow it? Yeah. 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 Tell me as well as the road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always stressful. Um, for a number of reasons, really. Um, firstly because you've got a line in this case on the table which is an older line so it's more of a risk and you've got the owner right next to you Charlotte who's obviously loved this line and it's like her pet so it kind of puts a bit of extra pressure on you uh, never really relax until you know the animals are fully awakened and home and I've, I've seen him just this morning now and he's very happy so I'm very happy so yeah <laughs> I can relax my dad bought the zoo in 1976 and then in 1977 the family moved down to the Isle of Wight um, and uh, I was just three months old at the time so all of my life that I can recollect has been spent here um, growing up in what was a really idyllic sort of environment and it's only now in my more mature years that I really understand the, the privileged experience that I had as a child. My dad did used to walk tigers on the beach back in the good old days. It's not an urban myth. Um, he did used to take them out for walks and sometimes in the sea because tigers like swimming. So I used to help him as well. We would go out for strolls on a Sunday with the tigers and I believe he used to take one of the tigers down to the local pub. When Dad had purchased the zoo, his initial idea had been to create a herpetological centre and that really all he would have at his zoo was reptiles and snakes, mainly venomous snakes. But he was totally passionate about uh, snakes and to such an extent that he had the biggest collection of venomous snakes at one stage anywhere in the country. The downside of that was that he, uh, he often got bitten by them. So he, he worked in very close proximity, often milking them to get their um, venom to be made into anti-venom. So during these very close encounters, obviously there's relatively high risk and he did get bitten nine times. Charles heads up our professional team of animal carers and with her vast experience and dedication, she's an excellent role model. It's definitely more than a job. Um, <laughs> it's, it's my life really. I've been involved in zoos for 24 years now um, I wouldn't want to do anything else ever. I just love it. I, I 
I love seeing the animals. After I've been off for a couple of days, I can't wait to get back. Lemurs are endemic to the island of Madagascar. Deforestation alongside the illegal pet and bushmeat trades are now forcing these primitive primates into a serious state of endangerment. For many years we've provided intensive funding for a project in the west of the island which teaches sustainable agriculture to local Malagasy people. Yeah, these, are, these are the mongoose lemurs. We've got four in the zoo. We've got uh, Soa McLovin. McLovin's very old. Uh, we think he's over 30. And then we've also got Michael and Catherine. Um, both Michael and McLovin are the most important males in Europe for the breeding program. We've got five different species of lemurs. Uh, at the moment we've got uh, two black and white rough lemurs. We've got Liberty, who's the mum, and we've got Lelena, who's her daughter, who's four years old. All the lemurs really like to sunbathe. Um, they'll use the sun a lot to, to warm themselves up and they really just like lying in the sun. Um, yeah, and the rough lemurs, generations of, of living in captivity, they don't have any fears, so they're quite happy to lie on the ground in the sun. They wouldn't do that in the wild. We have a black lemur who has a baby at the moment. We have uh, four black lemurs in the zoo. We've got the dad, Mitzia, um, and two females, Adala, and, and Tali, who's got the baby. And Tali is fairly young. She's only two years old. Um, and the baby's called Quintana, which is Malagasy for star. We have two red rough lemurs in the zoo. We have Andrew, who's our four-year-old male, and we've got Bonnie, seven-year-old female. Um, Andrew's got a very interesting story. He was rejected by his mum. Um, he suffers from epilepsy. Um, it took us a little while to, to get to the bottom of his problems. He's, he's on medication, so he's not part of a breeding program. Um, but he was hand reared here in the zoo. He's doing very well now. He, he has tablets twice a day. Um, he's brilliant. It's really fantastic to take a visitor in with a lima and they say quite often it, it's the best experience of their life. We've had that said many, many times. Mm. See, they're very gentle, aren't they? Yeah. 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 And they're quite unusual amongst lemurs because they live in really big groups. They're really social. Yeah. So they'd live in a group of maybe up to 30 lemurs. But the best thing is that the females are dominant. Really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the females reign. That's the way to do so it. <laughs> Michelle's the boss in the group. They're generally really curious whoever we bring in to meet them because as far as they're concerned it's entertainment for them. <laughs> A large part of the daily routine is preparing food for all of the animals. Yeah, the spider workers get fed twice a day. Um, so this is just an afternoon kind of snack, um, really. They get their main food in the mornings. So this is just a, a selection of fruit and veg um, and also monkey balls. Meal times can be a great opportunity for enrichment, so our animal carers have come up with creative ways of feeding our capuchin monkeys. So just making um, the eggs up, what we'll, what we'll do, we'll, we've got the plastic tubes, so we just put the bottom on, tip some egg in, and do it for a very short time in the microwave, and when we do the feed, we give them the tubes and we try and see if they can get the eggs out. They either use their fingers or they try and break them or they'll poke things in to try and get the eggs once they've been scrambled inside. So it's like an omelette inside the blue tubes. And then we just microwave it. So actually preparing the food for all the lemurs and the spider monkeys probably takes an hour plus just to make the food, about another hour to prepare it in the evening. Do you like cooking at home? Yeah I do, yeah I do all the cooking at home. My, uh, my partner Joel's not that keen on, uh, on cooking so I do all the cooking. In 1978 I joined the police and uh, I retired in November 2009 and uh, I moved to the island in my retirement. I got some spare time so I started to go as a volunteer and, uh, and in a very short time I if I wanted to be paid for, for the job because I was doing the gardening and the maintenance yeah. and I said yes please and then, then started here. Which, yeah I quite like Ike who is uh, the eldest, uh, the biggest spider monkey. He's, um, he's, a, he's a real character but he's also very naughty so we have to be very careful with him. Um, we've got a female spider monkey called Ella who's very old, she's 31 years old. 
which is sort of getting in the equivalent of the late 90s. She's got um, a problem with her throat and it keeps swelling up and going down, swelling up and going down. She's on antibiotics. And so what we do to make her take it, uh, we're trying Madeira cake, which she's been taking for two weeks, although the last two days she got reluctant, so we're going to try her on ginger cake this morning to see how she gets on. And all we do is cut a piece of ginger cake and then we just inject the amount of antibiotics so she can uh, she can take the food. Here we go. We have a group of bachelor wallabies, all male wallabies. We decided that we wouldn't have any females in the group because the minute you introduce females, potentially there's conflict. And we only wanted quite a small intimate group of wallabies because we knew that uh, they were going to form part of our encounter program so people can go in and feed them. And they're really gentle, perfect animals to use, especially for little children. It's really enriching for the wallabies. It's part of the day that they absolutely look forward to and really love. Most of the time they end up wanting to take a wallaby home. Wallabies are kept as pets. People sometimes use them as organic lawn mowers, um, but really they're best catered for in an environment where they get expert care. With albinos, where they're different, people like to see them. Um, unfortunately, they're not very well designed um, being albinos. They do get a lot of problems. We have to put suntan lotion on his ears stop them getting sunburned. Um, where he can't really see, their eyesight isn't as good as the, the normal brown wallabies. In the bright sunlight, they often sit out in the shade. People like to see them where they're, where they're a different colour. We have a high quality education programme for both schools and the visiting public too. This was inspired by my father who had a passion for sharing his love of animals with people. Some schools have got particular things they'd like to do. So for example, we have a school that comes from Bath who saw on Tiger Island the programme about the zoo when we use pinatas as enrichment and they wanted to take part in that as well. So now every year when they come over on their, their residential trip, they bring with them a set of pinatas which they've made for our big cats. They bring them on the coach. They um, contact me beforehand with a list and photographs and they have a whole half a term of cross-curricular work on big cats, which is underpinning their learning as well as making the pinatas for the animals. <laughs> so today's school are Farlington Prep School. We try to capture the learning objectives from the teachers. Today the children were uh, wanting to learn about big cats and they were particularly interested in uh, conservation of wildlife and human impact on the natural world. I would say our overarching ambition is to get the conservation message out into the world, out, out into the wide world, get children interested in animals and get them taking action for nature. Absolutely amazing. This is one of the pump rooms in the old Paleo 4, which is the funding of the seaside. And this is one of the last remaining Pluto pumps. I think there are only three left now. Most of them were scrapped after the Second World War. And they were used to pump fuel out to France for the D-Day landing. So it's really important. This site is a really important area, um, which ultimately helps us to win the war. What seem to be golf clubs, ice cream factories, and innocent seaside villas, all camouflaged against German air attacks were the pumping stations. Zoos are pretty spooky places at night, but this, this zoo is uh, that little bit scarier actually because the fort is haunted by a young officer who was killed in action. At the Isle of Wight Zoo we have a really holistic approach to the way that we care for our animals and a key part of making sure that they're happy and healthy is our enrichment programme. Sit, left. Good boy. Sit, grab. 
Good boy. Sit. Touch. Good boy. She's just doing a small bit of training with Shandru. Um, training is a, a massive part of our husbandry now. The reason we started the training program is because it makes health checks and medical procedures a lot easier, uh, a lot less invasive on the animal, um, and it helps build the trust relationship between us and the animals that we care for. I managed it the first day I stood back and I pointed down. I, was, I didn't point down, I was doing this. And he laid down and I was like, oh my God, it's amazing. <laughs> Well, this is our group of five adorable female meerkats. Zoos are cause for ever changing, their collections are dynamic, and um, I'm glad to say that we've recently recruited the services of these meerkats to help us to add value to the visitor experience, of course, they're animals that everybody can engage with, from really little children up to far more mature people. It's they're always active, they're always doing stuff, they're curious, they're naughty, um, and they're highly social, so we can really relate to them as human beings. There's lots of parallels that we draw from their behaviour. Um, so it's just, they're, they're brilliant tools, if you like, for getting people to stop and really observe the animals rather than just walk on past because they're not doing anything. So they're uh, mischievous creatures. Mary is one of our highly skilled big cat carers. This position carries an immense responsibility, not only to cater for the needs of the animals, but also to abide by strict health and safety protocols to ensure human welfare is never compromised. When I first started, it was actually the reptiles. I love reptiles. They're so kind of, there's so much unknown about them, uh, which I love. Um, but then as soon as I started working on cats, I love getting stuck in, so heavy lifting, um, doing butchery, I love it. So. Um, cats and reptiles are probably my favourite section. A lot of zoos now require um, a specialised course um, that Sparshout College do. Um, it's called the Dimza course and it's um, basically for zookeepers, um, which is really good. I actually did um, an animal management national diploma at Sparshout. So this here is Lola's bedroom. She's our female tiger. She's actually our smallest tiger. She weighs about 98 kilos, so she's really small. Okay, so this is actually Lola's favourite toy. Um, and you can see, <laughs> you can see if you get closer, how destroyed it is. I've always wanted to work with animals since I was tiny. Whenever we're doing cat movements, we always uh, work in pairs, so that reduces the risk of error. There's always two slides between you and the cat. So this is Lola's bedroom door, and she's got another one just outside. So whenever we put them in and out, we have someone working in here with the pulley just there, and then someone working in the slide just out there. One simple mistake with these extreme predators can be fatal. Lola is one of our feistiest cats, especially around feeding time. She was rescued from a French circus before coming here to us. One of the roles of the zoo is to provide a long-term home to rescued and confiscated animals. Sharing your office with a Jeffrey's cat. And this Jeffrey's cat was a rescue cat who was confiscated, um, being brought in as part of the uh, legal pet trade. 
So we were very happy to take him on. Um, he's really playful. Obviously he's quite young, so he's, everything is sort of new to him and every day is a new day. So he will find anything to play with, zips. <laughs> Us sometimes as well. And he's got lots of energy. <clears throat> he's a really exquisite looking animal though. Our Arcane Liberty came to us um, after she was surrendered as a pet. Um, they're very clever. She um, takes quite a long time to trust someone. Giving her food helps quite a lot. She isn't very fond of men because she used to be a pet. Maybe she had negative experiences with men. Their dexterous little hands mean that they are difficult to guard against. Naturally, you'll find raccoons in North America. Um, there are populations in Europe, though those are introduced. We have a female jaguar called Chiquita. She came to us from, weirdly, um, from Ireland where she was actually owned by a drugs dealer. So she was living in a drugs dealer's garage. She was found only because an elderly lady living opposite on the street suffering from insomnia kept seeing this weird sight of a large feline animal being walked round on the lead, round the block, at three o'clock in the morning. She kept phoning the police saying, you must come and investigate. They said, go back to bed, go and get some sleep. She was so persistent that eventually they did a door-to-door um, and uh, they discovered her living in a box in this chap's garage along with a serval, a small African wild cat. So they were both confiscated and then came to us. We know very little about her history. We've got no records at all. We can only guess them at her age, but I can spend a long time in her company. Obviously we don't, well, she doesn't speak to me. <laughs> I speak to her. Um, but it's just really nice to be in her zone. She's a fantastic animal. The skunks came to us at the zoo because they were originally pets but they were very overweight when they first came to us because they'd been overfed so we had to put them on a special diet to try and get them to lose some weight. Hey! Skunk There's one right here! Well, I might be biased, but Nala has got to be the best looking lioness ever. She has got eyes that just, well, you could swim in those eyes. She's just the most amazing creature. I've known her since she was nine months old. She came from Dartmoor Wildlife Park. Mm -hmm. You were a bit grumpy with Charlie last week, weren't you? You were. Hey, Nala! On a sweltering hot day at the zoo, there's nothing that Nala likes better than a good dollop of Minghella's ice cream. Nala! Nala! Mm, yum, yum, yum. Mm, yum. Nice bit of ginger there. Cook it. Oh, Chris, you'll eat this whole tub if you let her. Is it delicious? Oh, we dropped a little bit. Oh, we dropped a little bit. <laughs> oh, Nala, Nicole. She will eat vanilla, but her absolute favourite is this Mungilla Oriental Ginger and Honey Flavoured Ice Cream. It's also a really good way of helping us to put some sun cream onto her nose, which is quite sen sensitive. Although she's an African lion, she does Nala? get a, um, sometimes a sore nose if there's too much the UV. Nala? Good girl. Good girl. I know. Bizarre, I know. <laughs> I was 19 when I had my first tiger. Looking back on it, I think it might have been a strategic move on my dad's part because I was thinking about heading to university and um, what can you do? I ended up with a literally just hours old tiger cub in my hands. Um, I named her Zia and I remember to this day looking at her and knowing that she would transform my life. Um, she's still alive today.
his mom kicking your feet. Kicking your feet. Get off my tiger feet. Zia and our other tigers are acting as important ambassadors, helping us to deliver vital conservation messages. Sadly, their wild cousins are becoming increasingly rare throughout their native Asian homeland, where populations have crashed by 97% in the last 100 years. Poaching for traditional Chinese medicine, coupled with extensive habitat loss, are the main causes of their decline. We are the sole funders of a successful community-led conservation project in the Western Ghats of India. This provides training and support for local people to protect the tigers with whom they share their home. Despite the severity of the situation, we believe there's still hope for the preservation of the species within managed areas of the wild. Zia. She was really naughty, weren't you, a few weeks ago, and she destroyed part of her crush cage that we were training her to go in, and at night she bit off a piece of the wood and got it wedged right up on her, one of her molar teeth so we had to knock her out to get it off. Zina is Zia's sister and came to us when she was three weeks old. She is an Indian tiger who carries a recessive gene which has led to her unusual coloration. White tigers have not been seen in the wild since the 1950s when the last one was shot. Unfortunately, irresponsible inbreeding to promote the white gene has resulted in considerable health issues for some individuals. Zena developed glaucoma which led to the loss of an eye, and she has other physical ailments which require specialist veterinary care. We're just setting up the weighing scales in Zena's bedroom. Um, big cats are weighed regularly, just to monitor their weight, make sure they're not getting too many excess pounds put on. Um, it's, and it's particularly important as they get older um, to monitor their weight because if they are too heavy then they have extra pressure on their joints which for arthritic conditions is uh, not a good thing. Zena has got a specific problem which is something akin to irritable bowel syndrome in people and she has a really special diet so we have to particularly monitor her weight really closely so we're just going to get her in now and um, see what she's weighing in at. Hey, good girl. Mm -hmm. Clever girl. Yes. Good girl. 110 kilograms. Well done. Sound <laughs> I do have close contact, physical contact with the tigers, I do stroke them, I don't go in with them but I do stroke them. Of course nothing's 100% without risk but I can do this because the tigers trust me. Effectively they think that I'm their mum. What we do have is a, a way to let the staff have contact with them safely so we use washing up brushes like you use to clean out dishes. The brush is a way to help build up the relationship between keeper and animal. Uh, it's a great way to give some form of physical contact but keeping both of us safe. They absolutely love it. Um, they enjoy it just as much as we do. This is uh, Zia and Zina's joint effort of um, showing their artistic side. So this is a painting that they've done for us. I rather like it. I wish I was sure about that bit in the middle. But um, the rest of it is, yeah, it shows a sort of freedom of thought, I think. I like their choice of colour as well. Tigers, as we know, are quite high risk animals. Um, so it's a bit of a challenge to make sure we can get people close to them um, and give them a different dimension really to their experience with them, but keep them safe as well. But we've introduced a tiger milk feeding experience. Mm. It's just aim and fire basically with the milk trying to share it between them. Oh, so hey. Okay, are you ready? Yep. They'll, they'll come to you. <laughs> <laughs> you like that. Is that good? Oh. 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 Up, up, and ah. As soon as they get up, then you can feed them. This is where we can check their claws and make sure their claws aren't growing in or anything. Okay. 
you see a di totally different side to them when you're milk feeding because they're really placid and really laid back. But when you see Diamond with his food in the evening and his den, he's a totally different cat. It is like yeah. Jacqueline Hyde. He's, you know, the primal instinct to defend their food is, of course, millions of years old. So that's when he ceases to, ceases to look so cute and cuddly instantaneously. Yeah. And we give him a wide berth when he's yeah. got his food. Being that bit closer to the tigers during the tiger milk feeding experience, visitors may get the chance to hear the tiger chuffing. This is the way that tigers purr, which sounds something like this. One of the highlights of people's day here at the zoo, for sure, is seeing Casper up on his rock. It's a great photographic opportunity as well. So we often take people's Casper. cameras and then take hey photographs boy. through the mesh for them. Hey, Casper. Hey, boy. Hey, boy. Casper. One of the feeding enrichments for Casper is often tying the meat up onto the mesh panels. We tie it up around about eight foot. But to be honest, when you look at him feeding, he's just, he's at an angle where he could probably add another two foot on if he was stretched up. So standing underneath him and looking up at that site, you know, that's really humbling. He is an ordinary African lion in a sense, but he has an unusual colour morph which gives him this really pale coat and he's a phenomenal animal. He's really an iconic creature within the zoo. Diamond and Asia are particularly special tigers, you know, I've, I've known lots and lots of tigers. Um, I've never met tigers with the same kind of profile as Diamond and Asia, and obviously they're twins, so you sort of get two for the price of one really, and um, they are just magical animals. Everybody who meets them is just, they, they just melt your heart really. Although they're now at the age whereby in the wild they would probably be expiring to be honest. I stopped going in with them when they were a couple of years old. They, they were never aggressive towards me. There was never a hint that they were going to attack me, which people often find odd. You know, they say, well, they imagine that when they get to a certain age that they suddenly become aggressive. Of course, it's not the case, but they just become more dangerous because of their physical size and strength. And when they play, they play really rough and they don't take any consideration for the fact that you're not a tiger. It becomes a bit of an ethical issue really, whereby if you're going in with these animals that you know are capable of, of killing, um, then you put them in a really precarious situation because were they to attack, then your colleagues would be trying to save the human life um, over the animal life and I couldn't possibly conceive of putting them in that position. Tigers really love the water, maybe surprisingly, they, they love swimming and since Diamond and Asia's enclosure was particularly designed to have a nice big lake in it, we really utilise this as much as we possibly can for enrichment feeds. So we do lots of different feeds within the water setup, but one of the favourite things is to put the food onto a raft and then push it out, get out of the enclosure quick enough before it, it sort of comes to the side and then release Diamond and Asia. Perhaps surprisingly, um, there is one animal here at the zoo who has a special place in my heart, and that's a giant rabbit called Coco. She comes home with me and, and then I bring her to work in the morning. When Coco is at the zoo, she stays at the zoo farm. It's really nice for her there because she gets to hang out with other rabbits. We 
really hope that you've enjoyed your behind the scenes look at the zoo. And on behalf of myself, my team and our animals who unfortunately can't talk to you, we'd like to say thank you and we hope to see you again soon.